couple of comments before we go to break. Uh, number one, I'd like to thank the speakers this morning for, for being able to keep their presentations in a timely manner so that we can have this kind of conversation afterward. I think uh, a lot of times that's some of the best value of the presentations. So if uh, everybody else during the day will follow their lead as well, I think uh, we'll have some interesting conversations. Uh, Barbara asked me to remind you that if you do need a vegetarian uh, meal or dinner, it needs to be signed up with in the back now. Uh, otherwise, she won't be able to accommodate you. And finally, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for the break. Uh, Fisher Scientific is sponsoring the uh, break materials. So. As we all go back to our labs, uh, we might give them an extra order or two, or whatever the case may be. Uh, we're doing very well on time. We should uh, take about 15 minutes now and come back about uh, 10 Thank you very much. Is now a uh, professor at West Virginia University. According to the WVU booklet, which I put, picked up this week, the last week, uh, Dr. Kugler's research interests are focused on heterogeneous catalysis hydrocarbon separations, and material science. His current interests in cat catalysis concern catalytic cracking and the synthesis of alcohol from CO and H2 mixtures. And Ed actually is going to give the final paper this morning on cat cracking. If you noticed, we had a sequence of papers on cat cracking. And he will be completing that series and discuss the formation of aromatic molecules in catalytic cracking. Ed? Thank you. much for that nice introduction. I had uh, received the facts from you last week, and I guess you were asking about introductory materials. The weather had been so nice, it was hard to find time to look at the mail. Uh, but you, you seem to have found some, some information anyway. I wanted to talk about uh, cracking of model compounds this morning. And uh, I want to focus on the formation of aromatic products and to talk about uh, some uh, dissertation research of, uh, of Ramesh uh, Subramanian. Uh, Ramesh finished in January and is now at uh, Research Triangle Institute. And I'm going to uh, give a shot talking about some of his work. The motivation for this work goes back to a paper in 1989 uh, by Yatsu and Keyworth, where they reported doing column separations on uh, uh, FCC feedstock, where the paraffins were separated from the aromatics. And then they proceeded to crack this, uh, am I blocking your view, mm -hmm. this uh, paraffinic feed. And they found that uh, on the cracking, they made large uh, concentrations of aromatics. Uh, let's see, is there a pointer somewhere? Where they, they did a piano analysis on the gasoline, and they found that they had about 15% aromatics in the gasoline, and this was not too much different than uh, the aromatics found in cracking uh, the unseparated feedstock. So I, I found this, uh, this particularly curious and was interested in following up on, uh, on that work. And what I want to talk about then this morning is uh, cracking some model compounds. Uh, we're going to take a look at, uh, on this occasion, of cracking paraffins and olefins. We have uh, some linear uh, molecules and hexadecane. This is the largest. Uh, straight chain paraffin we could get before we started running into waxes and they were uh, problematic for us and then squalane is a branch uh, C30. From the olefin standpoint we want to look at one hexadecane and then uh, squalene uh, which uh, contains uh, six double bonds along with uh, the six methyl groups.
in, uh, in doing this work, uh, we chose uh, some standard catalysts. These are three catalysts from uh, the ASTM suite. Uh, we picked their low activity catalyst, which on our standard gas oil gives a MAC conversion of about 59, or I guess it's defined to be 59.39. Uh, uh, it gives, on the high conversion catalyst, it gives a MAC conversion of about 81, and then we picked something intermediate, uh, and their catalyst number six uh, gives a MAC conversion of about 70. Uh, this RR designation stands for round robin. This goes back to a round robin sequence of about 20 years ago. Uh, I, I one time tried to learn the identity of these catalysts, and they're, they're very uh, quiet as, as to what the identity is. I'm presuming that these are all uh, rare earth uh, uh, containing uh, zeolite catalysts. And we can look at the, the BET surface area and the T-plot area, uh, say that the zeolite area is by difference. And we can see that in the low activity catalyst, we have about 30% zeolite surface area. In the high activity catalyst, about 80% uh, zeolite surface area. And in the middle activity, about 40% of the surface area is coming from the zeolite. The uh, measurements we made uh, were uh, done in a MAT unit. Uh, we run the ASTM MAT test, which is at 900 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, cat to oil of three. Uh, this is just a schematic of the reactor. This is just a syringe drive. Uh, the syringe with your oil sample fits here. Uh, you, the, the, the purge gas, the nitrogen that is used, comes in from the side. Uh, the catalyst is the fixed bed reactor. There's a knockout in an ice bath, and the gas uh, then proceeds to displace water where it's collected over water. Uh, what we typically do are gas analyses uh, on the light product, GC analysis on the light product. We do uh, simulated distillation on the liquid, and then we also uh, look at the liquid uh, with GC mass spec uh, using a very polar column in order to separate the aromatics uh, from the aliphatics. Now, if we take a look at uh, hexane first, uh, hexadecane cracking, we see a wide range in, uh, in hexadecane conversion with the three catalysts, going from about 30% conversion with the low activity, about 90% with the high activity, and about 75% uh, with the intermediate. Uh, if we look, take a look at the distribution by carbon number, of the products, we see uh, very mundane uh, distribution. We see low C1s and C2s, which are a characteristic of carbonium ion cracking. We see a lot of C3, C4, C5, C6. And then over here on the right, this is our unreacted uh, hexadecane. And then we also make some slightly heavier product. Uh, than, uh, than our reactive, and this is normal in a cracking reaction because you have a combination of breaking down and, uh, and building up reactions uh, taking place. If we take a look at the aromatic products, from uh, the cracking. Uh, if we look at our low activity catalyst with about 30% conversion, we just see a trace of, uh, of aromatics in the product. If we look at the high activity catalyst, uh, we see about 6.5% uh, about uh, total aromatics in the gasoline range. Okay? What I found curious is we saw no benzene uh, we then go on and we find toluene, we find ethyl benzene and the z three xylene isomers. Uh, these are fairly close to equilibrium values. Uh, we then 
5 C9 and C10 aromatics. And in the C9 and C10s, uh, these are all highly branched aromatics. For example, we see uh, in the C9s uh, ethyl methyl uh, benzene, we see trimethyl benzenes, but we see no cumene, no n-propyl uh, benzene in the product. Uh, it's the same way in the C10s. The C10s are highly branched, uh, small chains. We see no butyl benzene or isobutyl benzene uh, in the product. If we move on then to take a look at uh, cracking squalane, this is a C30. Uh, with six methyl branches. Uh, for carbonium ion chemistry, we expect the tertiary carbons to give us much higher activity. And we see that with all three catalysts, we're running at just about 100% conversion. That, uh, we also see that on, with just working with glass beads, we also have high conversion of, uh, of squalane. If we look at uh, the aromatics formed from squalane cracking, what again caught my attention was that we found we could find no benzene in the product. Uh, with the squalane cracking, we couldn't even find a trace. Uh, again, our aromatics start with uh, with toluene. Uh, again, uh, C8 aromatics, the xylenes, and the ethyl benzene. Uh, fairly close to equilibrium distributions. And again, when we look at the C9s and the C10s, uh, they're highly branched uh, aromatics. We don't see the propyl uh, benzene, for example, uh, in either the C9 or the C10 uh, aromatic fraction. Uh, as far as overall uh, aromatic yield, the uh, the two, the high conversion catalyst and the intermediate conversion catalyst are very similar, and we find uh, a reasonable quantity of aromatics even with the low conversion or low activity catalyst uh, in looking at the squalane and cracking. <coughs> if we move along then to take a look at cracking olefins, we, uh, we expected going from a paraffin to an olefin, we would have higher uh, cracking activity. You remember with uh, this low activity catalyst, this, this RR1 in cracking hexadecane, we had about 30% conversion. Uh, when we go to the uh, hexadecane uh, and introduce the double bond, all of our conversions with the low, medium, and high activity catalysts are very close to 100%. Again, in looking at the aromatics, we find the same pattern. In fact, the pattern is starting to get dull at, uh, at this point. Again, no aromatics. We start to see aromatic products starting with toluene. We look at the C8s. We find C9s and C10s in high concentration. And as before, uh, these are uh, benzenes with, with multiple substituents and no chains larger than, uh, than than two carbons. Finally, in, in looking at paraffin and olefin model compounds, we've taken a look at squalene. Again, same conversion levels, about 99%. High activity when we have an olefin, or if we have multiple double bonds, and in this case, we have both. <coughs> and finally,
Hanley and looking at squalene cracking, uh, we, we start to see a difference. Okay. We find that uh, with squalene and going from the low activity catalyst to the high activity catalyst, we go from seeing no benzene to seeing a trace of benzene, but with some overlap on some other peaks, it was impossible to quantitate this, but this is a, this is a small number. Uh, to about 1% benzene with our highest activity catalyst. When uh, similar sorts of behavior in, in toluene, in ethylbenzene, and uh, the xylenes. However, when we get to the C9 and the C10 aromatics, uh, we start to see uh, much larger quantities in both uh, the C9 and the C10 products. And looking at squalene cracking, we also get to the point where we see our first multi-ring products. That uh, in this case, we're seeing uh, fairly substantial concentrations of substituted naphthalenes. If we look at the, uh, the product distribution from cracking the squalene, okay. Uh, before I showed you the distribution for cracking hexadecane, and we saw a maximum in this area around C3, C4, C5. Okay, we again see a maximum here, but we also see another maximum occurring okay, uh, with larger molecules, and these are going to be due to the high concentrations of aromatics that, uh, that we're seeing with squalene cracking because we can't reduce uh, the ring size uh, of these to the same extent that we can reduce the ring size of, uh, of an alkane uh, or, uh, or an old. If, uh, if we consider uh, a mechanism that might be taking place, I think most of us who have worked FCC are strong believers in carbenium ion chemistry. And uh, if, we, if we want to try to rationalize any products, this is the, what we'd like to try to use uh, for the rationalization. Now, we, talked, we heard a talk this morning about the alkylation. Or, yes, about alkylation. OK, we're this, looking at the reverse reaction. Uh, this is cumene. Cumene cracking is a favorite uh, reaction. Uh, with, with a long history. Uh, activities are, are usually very high. Uh, the products are usually very clean, okay, where you see primarily benzene and propylene. And this is, this is what we, at least I came in expecting for, uh, for aromatics formation. I expected to see uh, extensive amounts of aromatics formation and then dealkylation. Uh, the fact that we don't see that in cracking a large number of the molecules is suggestive that this is not taking place. Uh, another way that we could produce benzene would be to make a cyclohexane ring and then to dehydrogenate it, uh, probably through hydrogen transfer reactions. Uh, the fact that we're not seeing uh, very much benzene in most cases suggests that we're not going through this particular route either, that we're not making a cyclohexane ring. And, uh, and then removing the hydrogens uh, to form benzene. However, what, what we did see uh, in all cases was toluene formation and, uh, and xylene formation. And we can rationalize toluene formation fairly easily. Uh, for example, uh, if we have uh, an olefin, and this is one with, uh, with seven carbons, and ordinarily I think about forming the carbidium ion here at the olefin, uh, but if we, for example, formed it elsewhere in the chain, and we don't want to form a primary carbidium ion, so if we, if we form a secondary carbidium ion uh, at the, at next to the end of the chain, okay, we can then easily get cyclization, we can draw the uh, uh, the carbenium ion uh, with the unsaturation in this fashion. We can see that 
it should be quite easy uh, to form a bond between the area of electron uh, deficiency and the area where there's surplus electrons to form a cyclohexane. And then through the hydrogenation, we can rationalize uh, toluene formation. And this would be uh, a scheme that is, uh, is consistent with, uh, with the products that we observe. We could very easily uh, rationalize the same type of scheme if we're forming uh, branched uh, uh, aromatics. For example, we can, we can form a xylene, okay, if we start with a branched olefin. Okay. We'll, we'll conveniently put the double bond on one end. We'll form a secondary carbenium ion uh, on the other end of this molecule. Uh, redrawing it, you can see the <coughs> geometry for cyclization to give you the dimethylcyclohexane, uh, which can then go on to form a xylene. The same uh, arguments are then applied for forming the multi-ring aromatics. Okay. We simply start with a larger chain, okay. uh, form the carb secondary carbenium ion along the chain, get ring closure to form the substituted cyclohexane, have dehydrogenation to form the aromatic, and then uh, long chain aromatics are known to uh, to do self-alkylation, where if we form a carbonium ion on the ring, we can get ring closure uh, to form either uh, an indane or uh, a saturated and an aromatic ring on this, uh, this tetralin structure, and finally to have hydrogenation in order to form, or dehydrogenation in order to form an aptoid. So uh, we believe that uh, all the products we see are consistent with carbenium ion chemistry. Uh, we believe that uh, not observing benzene as a product is also consistent uh, with carbenium ion chemistry, where the major reactions would be cyclization to form a cyclohexane, and then dehydrogenation in order to form an aerobatic. So uh, the, uh, the conclusions that uh, I wish to draw from this are that uh, we certainly agree with, uh, with others uh, that aromatics are formed from olefins to paraffins. Uh, I certainly had to realize that it took, it carried on to the extent uh, that we have observed it uh, with the model compounds. We believe that the products uh, that we observe are con consistent with our carbonium <coughs> ion mechanism. And uh, we find that uh, benzene uh, is a minor product uh, when we're cracking uh, paraffins and olefins. Thank you. cyclopentanes and do you think that that is a possible alternative mechanism or do you, do you not see that at all? Uh, we didn't identify any cyclopentanes. Okay? We, didn't, we didn't really uh, worry about this with, within, the, uh, with, within the gaseous product and we didn't, uh, we didn't try to, to differentiate uh, the uh, alkanes. That we, from the GEC mass spec, we could identify them as being alkanes, okay, by the cracking pattern. Uh, and if they were alkanes, we then ignored them. Okay. Uh, we probably should have been able to find some, in, some indanes. And uh, 
we, we did not, uh, probably because we didn't look for those. Yes. What, what temperature were you running this cracking in? Uh, uh, was it, it the same for the branch than the old Yeah, in all, in all cases, we were running at 900 degrees F, uh, which, is, which is 482 centigrade. And it would be uh, a low temperature uh, for commercial cracking. Uh, I guess from the Grace Davison presentation, they were talking about uh, temperatures from 970 to about 1070. And I believe that uh, is more typical. Uh, but we were following ASTM mat uh, conditions, and uh, the, the agreed on temperature by that group was 900, so that's what we were using. I guess the, the yes. general thinking is that the, the, most of the benzene, uh, like the ethyl benzene, parazine, and stuff, are from uh, two mechanisms. One is the cyclization plus dehydrogenation, the other one is the dehydration. Okay. We do see, we do see uh, when you use a different hydrogen transfer catalyst, for example, if you use a high rares versus a low rares catalyst, you see it, the yield of, like, for example, benzene is going to be very different. Because that's an indication that the hydrogen transfer probably goes through the cyclization plus hydrogen transfer, uh, go to the formation of benzene or xylene and toluene. Yeah, Porma had also done some work where he was cracking uh, Longer chain alkyl benzenes, and he was he was finding very little benzene product, and was uh, observing a more complicated product in that case as well. Okay, thank you very much.